Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty's Justice Powered by Information webinar series, JPI. I'm Diane Russ Tierney. I'm the Executive Director of the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, and we're delighted to have you here. The webinar series that we've designed is for people who want to make a difference in their community. We want to give you the tools and information that you can use to make a difference, to change hearts and minds. And today we have a very special program for you. We're going to be learning about a new film called In the Executioner's Shadow. And we have the filmmakers here and we want to talk to you about the film and how you can uh, use the film in your communities to create the kind of world that we really want to see, one that's filled with compassion, one that's safe, one that uh, allows people to become the best that they can become. And so these are the kinds of tools we want to share with you. So we're going to start off by seeing a little bit of the film, and then we're going to talk to our filmmakers and hear what inspired them to make the film and how they would like to see you use it. So with that, I'd like to get us started. Mary Alice? Yes. yes. To 1999, I served as the chief executioner. I performed 62 executioners in 17 years. People that recommend the death penalty, the jury, the judge, if they had to perform the execution, I think that they would enlighten a different story on giving the death penalty to anyone. The United States is the last country in the developed West to execute criminals. About 50% of Americans are for the death penalty and 50% against it. Our capital uh, punishment system is flawed. This is not a matter of vengeance. It's a matter of justice. The death penalty, we believe, serves as a deterrent. Capital punishment is tainted by racial disparity. Having my father's killers executed did not bring me a sense of closure. Is it to restore society or is it to punish? If you take a life, shouldn't your life be taken? Justice is about us as a society. Nineteen eighty two was my first execution. I was a correctional officer. One of my main jobs were to save my lives. So when it came down to execution, I had to transform myself into a person that would take a life. Jerry Gibbons was appointed executioner in 1977 when the United States reinstated the death penalty. He grew up in the housing projects of Richmond, Virginia and remembers one tragic night at a party. When I was a teenager, I witnessed a young lady uh, being shot to death right before my eyes. I wanted revenge for the young lady because she was innocent. I was totally for the death penalty. My thing is that uh, if a person takes the uh, life of another person, then that person's life should be taken, and that's what I believe. Jerry received training to operate the electric chair and later to administer lethal injections. He became chief executioner in 1982. I would say my team members take pride in their work, their preparations, uh, 
getting this person ready for his next step in life. Prepare him to just to see his kids for the last time, a, a last kiss of his mother or sister, or even his wife or daughter. We all are human, you know, and this is one human that had made a mistake. And uh, we had to carry out the orders. Outside of his team of eight, Jerry told no one about his work as an executioner, not even his wife. We would keep it a secret, and I kept it a secret from my, my family. Since 1977, he and other executioners across the United States have put over 1,460 people to death. It's a punishment that's supposed to be reserved for the worst of the worst. It was a gorgeous day. It was a beautiful April morning. We met some friends in, in Boston. 23,000 runners and half a million spectators gathered for the Boston Marathon. Karen Brassard, her husband and daughter, were cheering a friend over the finish line. We were there for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, all excited with the crowd, watching everybody come through, and just suddenly it was this incredibly loud explosion. There were seven of us there. Six of us were injured. One of our dear friends lost both of her legs that day. I knew that my husband was pretty badly injured. My daughter had shrapnel from her hips to her feet. And I had shrapnel in both of my legs. The two blasts injured over 260 people and killed three, including Crystal Campbell, Lingzi Liu, and eight-year-old Martin Richard. Police pursued two brothers in a dramatic manhunt. Twenty-six-year-old Tamerlan Zarnaev was killed in a shootout. A day later, Police captured the younger brother, Zokar, alive. Over the next few months, Karen, Ron, and their daughter, like many of the bombing victims, had to undergo multiple surgeries. I'm going to try to not let this change who I am. I'm not going to let this prevent me from living the life that I want to live. I'm not going to be afraid. Later that summer, Karen traveled from her home in New Hampshire to Boston for Zarnayev's arraignment at the federal court. We were all seated together and he walked out. He didn't look at any of us, but his hand was obviously injured. And my immediate response was, I hope that hurts. I hope it's painful. That was not like me. And the recognition of that about me was scary because it isn't who I am. Zarnaev pled not guilty to all 30 counts, 17 punishable by death. The federal prosecutor asked victims if the U.S. should seek the death penalty. I don't know. I, um, I don't know. I don't know what justice is. I thought I knew.
What does society do when someone commits a horrific act of violence? For centuries, seeking justice was a community affair. And disproportionate blame fell on the poor, mentally disabled, and people of color. In the 1800s, some capital offenses were targeted specifically at slaves, establishing a racial bias that continues today. Executions reached a historic peak in the 1930s, averaging 167 per year. But then, in 1936, a gruesome execution caught the attention of the media. On August 14th, in Owensboro, Kentucky, Rainy Bethia was publicly hanged by a white sheriff. Many thought Bethia was innocent. One New York Times reporter wrote, 10,000 white persons, some jeering and others festive, saw a prayerful black man put to death today on Davies County's Pitt and Gallows. The outcry over Rainy Bethia's hanging did not put an end to capital punishment. Instead, it drove executions behind prison walls out of public view. State officials built death houses and institutionalized the practice. It's a death by formula. It's a scripted death. In the beginning, it was hanging. It was not only hanging, but it was public. And so you see the crowds coming and bringing a picnic lunch and celebrating. Then we moved from hanging to the electric chair. And then we began to have the horror stories that happened out of the electric chair. And then there's been the move to lethal injection. And lethal injection is like we're going medicinal so that we'll just be putting them to sleep. But not everyone agrees. The idea that they should go out in an opiate haze, that it should be a pleasant death, is absolutely perverse. The debate about the death penalty has become increasingly polarized and politicized. We want a system that's fair. We want a system that respects the dignity of, of human beings. The idea that we were executing innocent people was terrifying, and there was just no way that we hadn't and that we weren't. Some people kill with an attitude so callous, heinous, sadistic, that they have forfeited their right to live. I believe in a deterrent of one, and that is when we execute this person, we know he will never kill again. Why is it that the death penalty really comes down to, in many cases, just where you live, who your DA is? We can all recognize injustice when we see it. It's people not being treated fairly. It's people not getting a fair shot. You can be critical of the death penalty. You can be critical of the idea that the government has the right to kill and also hold compassion and concern for victims. Maybe in some books of justice, the person for this act deserves to die, but do we, as a society, deserve to kill them? Today, capital punishment largely falls to the state in which the crime was committed, and laws and methods vary widely. Most states use lethal injection, but some still use gas chambers. The electric chair hanging, and firing squads. In Philadelphia, nearly four years after Vicki and Sill's daughter Shannon was murdered, the police got a lead. In 2001, there had been a series of assaults started taking place out in Fort Collins, Colorado. They put out a, a report to police agencies all across the uh, United States. So they sent DNA from Shannon's case to Fort Collins. The DNA was a match. The suspect was married and employed at an Air Force base. So about eight o'clock that night, 23rd day of April, uh, 2002, this fellow and his wife walked into the police station. 
And by midnight that night, they had a full confession for the dozen different cases. The man they arrested was 29-year-old Troy Graves, Philadelphia's elusive Center City rapist. Graves was accused of multiple counts of sexual assault and one count of murder in the death of Shannon Sheber. The prosecutor was District Attorney Lynn Abraham. The prosecutor in the city of Philadelphia, who is known as a pretty deadly DA, in other words, she put more people on death row than uh, uh, any other prosecutor in Pennsylvania and probably any <laughs> a large number around the country. Troy Graves was found guilty, and the district attorney wanted the death penalty. But the Shebers did not. It meant they would have to fight for the life of their daughter's killer. We had said to each other and consulted with our very large families that what would we do if they ever caught him? Well, we would stick to our principles. You know, if someone was going to want him put to death, we were going to argue for life without the possibility of parole. The district attorney voiced her disagreement and outrage. The district attorney there became very, very upset, and she became very public with her, with her opinion. And she said, I don't care what the Shebers said. The death penalty was the appropriate sentence for their daughter's murder. Why would they not want it? For Vicki and Syl, the answer was clear. We just can't let this anger, this natural human anger and pain overwhelm us and, and make us so vengeful and, and hateful because it would just over time destroy us. And we knew that. Vicki and Syl received piles of hate mail, accusing them of not loving their daughter. You know, if you can't stand by your principles when it's difficult, they're not your principles. Thank you. That was a very powerful, powerful film and a wonderful tool. And I can't wait to share with you all how we can use that to help foster a really important debate. Uh, now I'd like to introduce the filmmakers to you. And I'm going to be very brief because hopefully through our questions, we're going to be able to find out more about them. And I want to remind you that you can ask questions just by typing them in and we'll try and get to as many as we can. The first person I want to introduce is Rick Stack. Um, he has de dedicated his professional life at American University to social justice. And that comes from his background, starting out first uh, working in the Jackson County, Missouri Public Defender's Office where he saw firsthand how on a daily basis, human error can create great travesties of injustice. Um, he also ha has worked in the area of uh, dealing with people who need the most help, uh, people who are hungry, people who are homeless, uh, as the founding executive director of the Capital Area Food Bank uh, and the first chair of the DC Central Kitchen. He developed a course uh, at American University called Politics of Hunger. Uh, and taught people about what that meant. Uh, and he's the author of several books, including uh, Litigation, Public Relations, Courting Public Opinion, uh, what was published in 1995, Courts, Counselors, and Correspondence, a Media Relations Analysis of the Legal System, that was published in 1998. Um, and that book was a, a, a pioneered look at communication and litigation. He's also published a number of books directly on the death penalty, Dead Wrong, Violence, Vengeance, and the Victims of Capital Punishment, that was published in 2006, um, where he helped reframe the debate about the death penalty from whether the death penalty is a deterrent to whether we can trust the government to make irreversible life and death decisions, given how many mistakes the government makes. Maggie Stogner is a professor of film and media arts at American University, and she brings over 30 years of filmmaking experience to the classroom. She is an award-winning producer and director. Uh, she, uh, during her nine years at the National Geographic, she produced uh, an award-winning, two award-winning series of Explorer and The Ultimate Explorer. In 2005, she launched Blue Bear Films, uh, and she's continued to direct, produce, and write international documentaries where she's looking at such international uh, cultural issues 
uh, as Gold Mountain and a number of other things. And so you all are really uh, fortunate to have these wonderful people with us. And what I'd like to do now is ask a few questions to kind of share more with the with our audience what brought you to this film. Obviously, this is a, an amazing film, uh, an act of love and commitment uh, on your part. And I want to know for each of you, what drove you to do this film? Diane, thanks for that wonderful introduction. I'll start with the first answer. Um, as you mentioned, I've written a couple books on the death penalty. Uh, and during my research, I've encountered some amazing people. I include you on that list. Thank you for being part of our project. Uh, and one of the leading lights in this field is Sister Helen Prejean, the author of Dead Man Walking. And I remember being in an audience and hearing her say, you need to tell your story in as many different ways uh, to as many different audiences as possible. And the written word has a certain power, but visual storytelling is even more powerful. And when Maggie came up to me after book talk and said, uh, you want to collaborate on a death penalty film? I said, I don't know how to do that. She said, I do. You want, you want a partner? And I said, sure. So, so that's that's the, the birthing of this particular project. Maggie? Thank you, Diane. It's really a pleasure to be part of this webinar. And uh, this has just been a wonderful collaboration. I mean, Rick has got this amazing depth of knowledge. Um, I have many years of uh, filmmaking experience. I think what was sticking in my craw for the last few years is how do we hold ourselves up as a human rights beacon, as a leader in human rights when the U.S. still has capital punishment, still executes people? It just seems so wrong. And the fact that we're the last country in the um, developed West to, to have capital punishment, I, it just really just seemed wrong. Now, I grew up in San Francisco, right where San Quentin Prison is, which has the largest number, 740 people on death row. Um, and so I, I had an awareness about the capital punishment my entire life, and I think this was just an opportunity to dive in and see if we could make a film, challenging, but see if we could make a film to really engage people in meaningful, informed discussion and dialogue around this issue. Well, you know, just in that little clip, I mean, you put out all of the the arguments you, you you put out all the uh, you know affected characters the people um, it really was it's a wonderful wonderful tool for discussion and both of you are obviously very knowledgeable um, Rick you've written several books about the death penalty Maggie you've you know studied the world and presented the world to us was there anything about this film or in the making of this film that surprised you something that you didn't know that you'd want to share with us um, I'll start with those. Um, I'm going to refer again to Sister Helen Prichon. Uh While we were before, while we were setting up the interview, the lighting and the sound and all the rest, I got a chance to have a private side conversation with her, and I asked her a similar question: What was your biggest takeaway from mm -hmm. Dead Man Walking? And she spoke about it like it was just yesterday, and she said Tim Robbins, uh, the significant other of Susan Sarandon, who played Sister Helen, and Tim Robbins would converted her book to the screenplay, she said, Tim Robbins taught me the difference between art and propaganda. And Maggie and I were struggling with how to tell this story, which is a huge, you know, vast story. Mm -hmm. uh, and she conveyed, I said, so, so what is the difference? And she conveyed her answer. Recall the, the movie. Periodically, they would have a flashback to the scene where the nasty crime was committed that wound up the Sean Penn character on death row. And the Sean Penn character was a very unlovely character. Had no sympathy for this guy for the first hour and 25 minutes of the movie. Uh, and they would make you know, you know, that what he did that was so terrible. That the crimes mm -hmm. caught him on to death. They had the build up and the build up and the build up. And Sister Helen, this was her first opportunity to do pastoral counseling for a death row inmate. And at some point along the line, she encounters, she does a, a town hall meeting and encounters the families, uh, the, the, the parents of the two murder victims. And they look at her and say, don't you care about us? And it, it blew her away. She realized she was giving all of her energy to one side of this equation when there was a very valid need for sympathy, empathy, and support for another side of the equation. So the movie 
it marches on to its climax. And at the very end, the Sean Penn character breaks down, shows himself to me, pleads for Sister Helen to um, save his soul, to pray for him. And she said at that point, had we ended the movie right there, that would have been propaganda. Mm -hmm. As filmmakers, we would have been telling you how to think and what to think, and that would have been an easy end. But Tim Robbins came back and added one more flashback to the horrible rape and murder scenes. Mm -hmm. And so as an audience, you're left there thinking, ooh, yeah, I have some sympathy for this guy, but he was a monster. And it was that balance that we struggled so hard to try to achieve during the making of this movie. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes um, Maggie. I, I have several areas of, of surprise, I think, through the course of it. And this is a project we've been working on for five years now. Um, one is, it's such a polarized issue. And we really wanted to get at that area that's more ambivalent, ambiguous, people who are on the fence or haven't really thought about the issue very much. Um, and, and how do you do that? And I was surprised by how thoughtful the people in that arena are. Um, our character, Karen Broussard, uh, is incredibly thoughtful. She struggles for two years to come to um, this with her decision about what she wants to have happen to the Boston Marathon. Um, that, that level of the ability to engage people in civil discourse, I wasn't sure was there. So, so that was a great surprise. I say from a personal level, if you'd asked me five years ago that I was going to end up being buddies with uh, the former chief executioner of the state of Virginia, <laughs> I, I, don't, I wouldn't have predicted that one. So, you know, that, but that again comes from that thoughtfulness. I mean, he, mm -hmm. he, very, uh, he articulates his, his emotions and, and his feelings and his journey um, in a way that you, you really is very human, very raw, very human. So I think that came as a surprise as well. I mean, I think your responses really go to the heart of why this film is so helpful uh, and so powerful. I mean, you know, oftentimes people who are against the death penalty sort of get, I will say, cartoonized to be like, you know, we're not for victims, you're, you're pro-crime. And I think what you're bringing out through the film and through your experience and what you're sharing is that this is complicated. And I, I keep going back to what the, the Shebers said, you know, you know, where do you stand? What do you stand for? In the toughest of times, I think that's the central question um, that the death penalty presents to us as a society. And I think the kind of uh, conversation that people who are watching this this video uh, can can use to sort of spark a conversation: Who do we want to be, uh, and how do we get there? And what are the the different parts of that that this film brings forward? Um, which I think leads to a question I want to raise: What do you want people to do um, after seeing this film, and and how do you want them to use it? Because you didn't just make it because it, it, you, you were compelled to do it, you wanted to make a difference and have an impact. I think that the impact portion was really, really important. I mean, on a, a grassroots level, and you brought it up in our April 11th event, you know, it's friends and family, getting people to talk, engaging people around you to discuss, and then that in concentric circle kind of continues to engage and engage. Ideally, get people to vote. <laughs> you know, this is coming up in a lot of different states. The more states that repeal the death penalty, the better chance we have of repealing it nationally. So get people to vote. And I hope that this film engages those people who um, really are on the fence, who really don't have a, a, a clear idea in their head and, and motivates them to, to really be informed and, and to really think about I, I had to embrace with faith <laughs> what Thurgood, uh, former Just, Chief Justice Thurgood Marshall said, which is if you really learn about this issue, really understand it, you cannot come to any other conclusion but overturn the punishment. And, I, and I, I truly believe that if people really get engaged. So this film, I hope, will really engage people to, to talk and, and vote. And the way to get to Thurgood Marshall's conclusion uh, is very important to have a journey that uh, emphasizes values, um, compassion, and respect, and loving conversation, dialogue between people who may not agree, but the more they think about it, the more they go over each other's points of view, um, the more they're going to have a meeting of minds. Uh, in addition to Thurgood Marshall, um, one of Sister Helen's uh, insights was the reason this 
problem and the death penalty persists. People don't want to think about it. And what we're trying to do is get them to think about it in a very respectful fashion. The, the film certainly sets that tone. And um, people can get this film, I think, by uh, emailing us. I think we're setting up a special uh, email box uh, so that people can contact us and then we'll connect with you to get them access to the film. I understand you're working on some materials that people can use uh, to uh, have conversations at the dinner table, to have conversations at their places of worship, to have community engagement, uh, you know, events where they show the film. Do you want to say anything more about that? Um, yeah, we are setting up, and we, we um, have, I, uh, yeah, well, New Hampton, bra breaking New news, breaking New news, New Hampshire's <laughs> um, coalition to um, abolish death penalty has asked us if they can have screenings around the state in libraries, community centers, a very grassroots um, effort in order to um, support their efforts to repeal the death penalty, which is going up to um, the vote uh, in this fall. They're right on the cusp. That, that yeah. state um, Excellent. passed repeal. The governor has said, I'm going to override that. And now the state grassroots organization wants to make sure they've got the votes to override the override. Uh, and for them, they just reached out to us a couple of days ago uh, to use this video. I think probably because they heard of it through you. Thank you very much. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's an honor. Uh, to be just a teeny part of some state's coalition to dismantle the death. Well, excellent. If you're interested in, in getting access to this uh, film and getting the materials, uh, you can email us at executionershadow at ncadp.org. We'll put you in touch with Rick and Maggie and the materials that they have. Uh, you can also uh, reach out to us at uh, info at ncadp.org, and we'll make sure that you get connected. Uh, and we'll also publicize this on our website and using social media. So thank you so much for, uh, you know, sharing this time with us. I'd like to thank our, uh, Jacqueline Lansman, who put this webinar together, as well as our others, and Mary Alice McMillan, who works especially on this webinar. Uh, this has been a labor of love for all of us. And I want to close by saying you are our justice. Vote, run for office, and vote. Thank you both. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.